welcome to Sonoma Kids Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Kat Smith. And with me today, I have meteorology and forecasting superstars, uh, Jeff and Patrick from Sonoma Technology. Welcome to the show. And thank you so much for answering the kids' questions today. Thanks for having us. We are really excited. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about what we do first before we dive into the questions. Jeff and I are air quality meteorologists at Sonoma Technology, which is an air quality firm in Petaluma, California. So we forecast air quality for a number of regions across the country every day. We have meteorology backgrounds, but we also uh, have training in atmospheric chemistry and pollution. And so we apply what we know about meteorology to air quality to make air quality forecasts every day. I've been with the company for um, 13 years now, and Jeff joined us more recently. Jeff, I'll let you tell, tell them about yourself. Yeah, so my background is not only in meteorology, uh, but I came to Sonoma Technology from uh, the television field. I was a television meteorologist in Tucson, Arizona for over a decade. Um, and yeah, I was able to apply meteorology skills that I had learned from my alma mater, St. Cloud State University. It's something I've used each and every day since December of 2007 when I left campus. Uh, and uh, also uh, have some experience, obviously, with broadcast journalism, which uh, really helps out with things like this, talking to kids and being out in public. We have a podcast that we do. Uh, we communicate with our clients day in and day out at Sonoma Technology with our forecasts. So, um, yeah, super happy to be here and all about the kids and would love to answer all of their really, really great questions. And really quickly, because I don't think anybody asked this question, um, do you want to just kind of nutshell, what is meteorology? Meteorology. How much time do we have for this, Patrick? <laughs> go, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, meteorology is not the study of meteors. We're going to put that out there right away. Uh, no, it is the study of weather and the atmosphere here on Earth. Wind patterns, temperature, precipitation, cloud cover. Uh, you name it, these are the fields that we are interested in and what we look at each and every day at Sonoma Technology uh, relating weather to air pollution and air quality that we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, let's just jump into the questions. Um, we had a lot. Uh, th this, this was a good subject, I think. And um, a couple of the kids even asked multiple questions, which was kind of fun and exciting. So they're very curious and I can't wait for you to answer their questions. We are going to start with um, rain, sleet, and snow. Um, Graham, age 10, in all capital letters, I want it to rain again. When will it come? <laughs> yeah, so this is a great question. We've had a really dry summer and early fall season here, and it, that question is on all of our minds. When is it going to rain again? So I took a look at the forecast this morning, and we are in the middle of a dry period right now but I looked at some of the weather models and we're gonna be talking about models uh, a, little, a little bit later on, I think, but I'm talking about computer models, really sophisticated models that are used to predict the weather. And they really help out forecasters when they are making their forecasts. So I looked at those models and there was uh, one in particular that showed that there might be rain next Friday. So not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, we've got our fingers crossed uh, looks like a cold front is going to move through. And as you might know, uh, rain is associated with cold fronts quite often. So we are expecting and hoping for some rain um, in about eight days. Now, when we're making a forecast that far out, there is some uncertainty. That basically means we're not quite sure if that rain is actually going to happen yet. But like I said, we're hoping for it. So it might be another week and then hopefully we will start to get rain more frequently as we head into winter. Awesome, that's good news for the plants for sure. <laughs> yes. um, Lucia, age 10, wants to know, where is the worst place to have a lot of snow? I'll, I'll take this one. As a native Minnesotan, I'm gonna go ahead and put Minnesota right into <laughs> uh, the discussion, uh, where I always joke that we have uh, winter about 13 months out of the year there. No, uh, the worst place to have snow in the world, Northwest Japan. There is a prefecture, a state in Japan that gets this, averages 125 feet of snow per year. 
125. Wow. Yeah, that is a lot. <laughs> Uh, as far as here domestically in the United States, Mount Rainier is the snowiest place uh, here in the United States. That's a great question, though. And uh, I know we're going to be talking a little bit more about snow coming up here. So, uh, yes, Mount Rainier is, is in Washington State. Yeah. Okay. I think I've, I've driven past it once or twice and, and saw it on the map. So, back when we used to use maps, kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maria, no, sorry, Maya, age 10. Could it ever snow in Sonoma? And um, similar, Hanai, age 10, wants to know, why do we not have snow at all? That's a great question. I think we can lump them all together here. Uh, could it ever snow in Sonoma? And why do we not have snow at all? Well, there's a non-zero chance every year that it could snow in Sonoma, right? Um, but generally, it is just, frankly, too warm for it to snow here in Sonoma County. Uh, reason being, we have these storm systems in the winter that drop out of Canada or the Gulf of Alaska, very cold air masses, and oftentimes these storm systems have to pass over the Pacific Ocean. And what the Pacific Ocean does is modify or warm up that air mass just enough where it is too warm for snow to reach the ground here into the lower elevations of Sonoma County. That being said, it could still be cold in the upper levels of the atmosphere to the point that we could see a little bit of snow on say Sonoma Mountain or some of the other coastal ranges here in Northern California. And Patrick, I'll let you kind of talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so one of the things um, that we know is that it is generally colder, the temperatures are colder at higher elevations. So as Jeff pointed out, sometimes on the top of the high hills or the, the mountains, we can get a little bit of snow in Sonoma County. And Jeff might remember when he first moved to the area, just a couple of weeks after he moved here, which happened to be in January one year, uh, we did get some snow on Sonoma Mountain. The snow level was down to about a thousand feet. So once we got up to that elevation, it was just cool enough for the precipitation to be in the form of snow. So it's pretty rare to get snow in Sonoma County. Sometimes we'll get it at the higher elevations. Can I tell you one of the weirdest weather things I've had happen living in Sonoma Valley? And I grew up here. Um, when when the thunderstorms happened that sparked the wildfires very recently, um, on the day of the lightning fires, or sorry, the lightning storm, um, it was a super hot day, but we actually had hail on that day. Yes. That how can I? That's probably an hour long answer, and I <laughs> don't need to hog the kids' time. But that was a really weird occurrence for me, having grown up here, never had that experience before. What was weird about that situation? Uh, number one, just thunderstorms during our dry season, right? That alone is an oddity here in the Bay Area, but also. Uh, you'll recall perhaps your phone woke you up at about 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning that Sunday to the entire Bay Area being under a severe thunderstorm warning which had to have been the largest severe thunderstorm warning ever issued by the National Weather Service. I have never seen uh, that many people impacted by a severe thunderstorm warning. It was very uh, very impressive and very rare for sure. And it was a really interesting situation too because of the extreme heat um, that actually made the atmosphere really unstable and that contributed directly to the widespread uh, lightning and thunderstorms. So it was a, a pretty unique situation, very hot, leading to a lot of instability um, and that led to the, the thunderstorms and possibly some hail, yeah. And also should point out too, I believe with all that instability, there was also uh, a bit of a boost in moisture from a decaying tropical storm in the eastern Pacific right. ended up moving over our region as well, that moisture moving over the region. So uh, all in all, a rather exceptional event that uh, really for Patrick and I impacted our jobs as air quality meteorologists for Absolutely. a couple of months, uh, uh, creating forecasts for some of our clients here in Northern California. And That's our true. next question is about hail. So that was a nice segue I just did. <laughs> um, Zyra, age 11, wants to know how is ice formed uh, from hail? But I, I, I'll let you interpret how that, how that sure. answer will go. <laughs> sure, Patrick, I can start this one off here. So yep. in a thunderstorm, you have rising air. And rising air, as it moves up into the atmosphere, uh, it cools, it ends up condensing, and it forms little, little ice crystals. Well, those little ice crystals 
start to gather other ice crystals in their journey up into the clouds. And eventually you get a little hailstone. But still, as you're adding all these ice crystals up, the hailstone can grow larger and larger and larger until it becomes so heavy that it falls out of the cloud and reaches the ground here. And sometimes you can actually have those hailstones recirculate within a cloud. So they might get lifted up and they, they gather more ice, then they start to fall. But then depending on how unstable the atmosphere is and how much lift there is in a cloud, it can be circulated several times and it can just accumulate ice on its surface until, as Jeff said, it finally gets too heavy and it falls out. So the size of the hailstone uh, relates to how many times it's been circulated within that cloud, basically. And basically, I think for golf ball size hail to sustain any thunderstorm to be suspended in the air, uh, I believe you need to have rising air to the tune of about 55 to 60 miles per hour. So basically, as fast as you drive on the 101. <laughs> wow. That's how fast the air needs to be rising in order to keep that hailstone lofted in the atmosphere. And that's really remarkable. We think about winds sort of blowing horizontally from side to side, but there are vertical wind motions, especially within these clouds um, and especially during thunderstorms. You get to ask the best questions. I learned so much. I, they're asking the questions, but I sit here every week going, oh, wow, that's fascinating. And I'm learning along with them. <laughs> these are really good questions. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on to a new subject, smoke and fire related weather. Uh, Grant, age 10, what happens to smoke after a fire? This is something that Jeff and I pay attention to very closely because we have to forecast the air quality. So we are paying a lot of attention to exactly what is happening to smoke coming from fires. Um, but I think this question is sort of asking, well, what happens when the smoke gets really far away from fires? Um, or it's been a long time since that smoke was produced. So the first thing I wanna point out is that smoke is a really complex uh, mixture of particles. It also has some gases and those, those particles and gases can be transported really far. That just means that the, the wind will carry that smoke. It could be hundreds or even thousands of miles. So that's sort of the first thing that happens to smoke after a fire is that it can be pushed around um, even several states away or across entire oceans. Um, but then eventually a lot of that smoke actually just gradually falls to the ground, especially the larger particles. Now, some of the really tiny particles might stay in the atmosphere for a long time. Now, I mentioned that there are also gases in smoke and the gases can actually remain in the atmosphere for, for a very long time. It depends on which part of the smoke that we're talking about. There's also one, one other uh, situation that might help remove uh, the smoke from the atmosphere, and that would just be a, a rainstorm. Uh, the raindrops can actually gather, or as they say, scavenge those smoke particles from the atmosphere and bring them back to the ground. So eventually it does, a lot of the smoke does come back to the ground, but it can be transported great distances before that happens. And uh, speaking of the particles, our next question, um, Ryan, I think is how she pronounces it, age 11, what is smoke made of? So I mentioned this a, <clears throat> a little bit in the last question. It is a complex mixture, um, but mostly the smoke is made up of the things that have just burned. So especially if we have a wildfire in a forest area, we're talking about trees mostly, and most of that is carbon. So we get these, uh, what they call black carbon, um, particles within the smoke. So a lot of times when you see ash sort of raining down under, under a smoke uh, plume, a lot of that is carbon. Uh, but in, in addition to that, it can be a, a complex mixture of a lot of different types of particles, um, different, different types of molecules, and different gases as well. And Zyra had another question. Uh, why does the sky turn red when there are fires? Ah, uh, that's the $64,000 question, you know, because that happened, what, about a month or so ago here in the Bay Area? Uh, this has to do with the scattering of sunlight. And I'm going to break this down into a couple of different discussions here. So make this as short and sweet as humanly possible. Let's start on a perfectly sunny day, uh, perhaps like the one that we're having here this afternoon. 
on a sunny day, the gases and the particles here in the atmosphere, uh, they end up scattering more blue light and, than the other colors. So that's why it's visible to us here on a clear, sunny blue day that blue light is visible. On top of that, uh, the reason that the blue light shows up better is because the sun has to travel a relatively short distance through the atmosphere to reach the ground. And that's why another reason why we see the blue color in the sky. I know it probably seems like, oh wait, relatively short distance in the atmosphere because the sun's way up there and the atmosphere is so thick and whatnot, but uh, it actually is a relatively short distance compared to sunsets when you have the sunlight traveling through much more of the atmosphere and that makes the reds and the oranges uh, a little more visible. Now, during a fire, when there is smoke, the smoke, what it does is scatters the red and the orange colors way more effectively and it blocks out that blue light. And that's why during a fire, when there is smoke around, the sky can turn red. And it also has to do with um, the size of the, the particles. So the smoke particles are larger than the, the, the particles that um, the sky, that the sunlight is normally scattered um, through the sky by. So uh, the, the larger particles tend to scatter the red colors. And you know, the red sky is what actually inspired me to reach out to meteorologists to answer questions this time, because I knew they'd have questions. <laughs> um, now we have some random weather questions. Uh, Jonah, age 10, is the earth slowly getting hotter? Also, what was the hottest day on earth recorded? I'll take the first part of this. So um, scientists have been taking measurements of the earth's temperature all over the globe for a long time now and the evidence does indicate that yes the earth is slowly getting warmer and i think we have we'll have a chance to talk about this more a little bit uh later but that's largely because of the greenhouse effect uh which warms uh the atmosphere and there are some gases in the atmosphere that warm the atmosphere more uh than other gases and humans have been adding those gases uh to the atmosphere for at least the last 150 years, uh, leading to more warming than we would normally expect. Now it happens so gradually that you don't necessarily notice it year to year. Each year has some really hot days in it, but uh, this, gra this warming effect has been really gradual over the last 100 years or so. And I'll let Jeff talk about the, uh, the hottest day on earth. The back half of the question, yeah. Uh, so while there is still a little bit up for debate, even though it happened back in 1913, yes, people are still debating this temperature and whether it is legitimate, but by all accounts, it is still a legitimate reading. The hottest day recorded on Earth was in Death Valley, California, back on July 10th of 1913, when the thermometer hit a blistering 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my goodness. And I'm thinking about that big giant um, thermometer on the way to Vegas. Uh, how <laughs> high does that thermometer actually go? I mean, would you be able to see that or was it just the weather people keeping track? Oh, that's a good question. Back in 1913, are we talking? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's true. I don't think it would be there. <laughs> I mean, that would be quite the technological advancement. Yes, um, yeah. I, but I think it's amazing enough in itself that in 1913 that they were able to take a temperature of 134 degrees and here it is 2020 and we're still talking about it as a reliable record for the hottest temperature ever recorded on earth. Yeah, that is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here we go. Miles, age 10 says, how did we figure out how to, this was a perfect segue. Uh, yeah. How did we figure out how to tell the weather? And I think he means, how did we figure out forecasting? Sure. It wasn't a rock. We'll put it that way. It's not a rock on a string. Uh, there are several things that help us figure out exactly what the weather is going to do and what may happen in the next seven to 10 days. Um, and Patrick and I will kind of tag team this one here. Um, first and foremost, the most important thing is what we just talked about, observational data. What's the temperature right now? What's the wind right now? We have weather stations, numerous weather stations across the country and across the world that tell us that. For our purposes here at Sonoma Technology, we're interested in that, but we're interested also in the air quality monitors that are set up across the country. And I believe there's probably over 2000 air quality monitors at set least, up here yeah. in the lower 48. Does that sound about right, Patrick? Yeah, at least that, yeah. 
Okay, so, and these measure things like ozone and particulate matter, dust, smoke. So we are certainly interested in our forecasting uh, purposes, uh, taking a look at those monitors and seeing what's happening right now, because that's certainly part of the puzzle. What's happening right now? And then the other part of it is what's happening in the future as well. Uh, we have very sophisticated tools called weather models. And I think the shorthand answer to what a weather model is, it's a big long math equation that takes in all sorts of different weather variables, be it, be it moisture or wind or temperature, puts it all into an equation, spits out a forecast for seven to 10 days out. So that's the shorthand version of weather models. And Patrick, I'll let you pick it up from there if you'd like. Yeah, that, that basically explains it, but there, like Jeff was sort of indicating, there are two parts to it. There is uh, the, there are the weather observations. So we need to observe what's currently happening with the weather. We take measurements of, like you said, the, the moisture, the wind, the temperature, um, not just at the surface, but above the surface. And we feed those observations into these computer models that use equations from math and physics to calculate what's going to happen in the future. So that's been a, a really interesting um, area of, our, of, of meteorology. In the last 30 years, especially, these weather models have gotten much more sophisticated and more accurate. So um, those, are, those are tools that Jeff and I rely on every day and they really help uh, to make our jobs easier when we're predicting the weather. And just, we left out a couple of tools, by the way. Uh, satellite imagery, the satellites up in space taking pictures of the clouds for air quality meteorologists, that's certainly important. Uh, also important that they also can pick up where dust is visible and possibly moving across the country. Uh, and of course, wildfire smoke as well. And then there's Doppler radar. Um, which detects where it's raining, how hard it's raining. Uh, with air quality, Doppler radar can actually pick up individual smoke plumes from fires, so we can detect where that is. It can also detect uh, the way the winds are blowing and whether there's rotation in a thunderstorm, so we can try to see if there are tornadoes that are developing with thunderstorms. So um, we have a lot of tools in our tool chest that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. It is amazing that we even have access to that technology now too. I, I remember being at a rugby game um, back when we were allowed to be around people. And um, I had the KTVU weather app on my phone and you could pull up that radar and it was it was a spotty rainy day. So every once in a while it would rain and I just had the app open and every time I could see, okay, it's about to hit us, I'd pop up my umbrella and then it would hit and it would pass and I just wait for it to happen again. I was the driest person at the rugby game. <laughs> About how much technology has advanced in the last even 10 to 15 years to allow us that option to right? just go onto your phone and look up a radar weather app to see if the rain's going to be moving in. Yeah, it's uh, just it's, amazing. It, it, it's absolutely amazing. So let's see, how did we figure out the weather? Um, and we just covered, so Jade, age 10, I think that we just answered your question also, which was how do you use technology for weather? Um, yeah. And also Avery, age 11, I think we answered yours because you wanted to know what the tools were. Um, so we're gonna move on to Jonah, age 10. What is the coldest place on earth? I think it's Minnesota we established. And um, <laughs> what was the lowest degree it got to? Jeff, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, Patrick, she used my bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's good though. Uh, it's, it's not Minnesota. No, it's not Minnesota. Uh, I did look it up. Let's go to Antarctica, shall we? Okay. In July 1983, remember Southern Hemisphere, our summer is their winter. So July 1983 in Antarctica, the thermometer bottomed out at 128 degrees below zero. Wow. On a balmy July day in 1983 in Antarctica. And that plays a little game with your mind because you hear July and you think hot. So, right. wow. <laughs> Santa right at home in July down there in Antarctica. Exactly. Um, Isabel, age 10. Oh, sorry, Isabella, age 10. How does it, and in parentheses, I put the weather because I believe she was asking the weather. How does it know to get ready for winter or spring, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and thank you, Isabella. And actually, thank you to all the kids for just the tremendous questions uh, that, that we got in. Uh, I think generally the weather is just responding to the way that the earth is tilted uh, in relation to the sun and our orbit around the sun on a yearly basis. Uh, and let's think about during the winter time. 
the earth is actually tilted away from the sun. So we're not seeing as much sunlight. So that's why our days are cooler. Conversely, in the summertime, the earth is tilted toward the sun. We see more sunlight, we see warmer days. So really the weather is just responding to the way that the earth is tilted in relation to the sun. Right, and, and also how much heating we're get, uh, getting each day. So during the summer, there's a longer period of heating because as Jeff pointed out, um, we're, we're getting more sun. So yeah, that contributes to the change in the seasons every year. And let's see, we have uh, oh, several kids ask this question, so it must be a big one. Uh, <laughs> Andrea, age 10, and Avery, oh, sorry, Avery and Himina, I think I'm pronouncing your name right, both age 11. Why does the weather change so fast in one day, and how come it's 80 degrees, and then the next thing you know, it's 100 degrees? Because this, we live in Northern great... California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Patrick. This is a great question. And Jeff and I have to deal with this a lot in our forecasts. Things can change really rapidly and the air quality can change really rapidly. Um, the way I wanted to start this one off was basically just talking about there are a number of factors that can um, influence the temperature, for instance, in a particular region. Uh, some of it has to do with high pressure systems, low pressure systems, uh, the wind direction, the wind speed. One major driver of the temperature is the cloud cover. So you might have cloud cover one day and then it burns off the next day. Um, but really the, the, the rapidly changing weather from day to day uh, is driven by different what we call air masses. So you might have a cool air mass right next to a really warm one. And as you transition from one to the other, you can have a really rapid change in the temperature. And that's often associated, for instance, with a cold front. So a cold front is just a boundary between those two different air masses, a one that's warm and one that's much cooler. And when that passes through, you know, you have a new air mass that has different characteristics and it can be much, much cooler. Uh, it, it can also work the other way where you have uh, really quick heating from one day to the next. Jeff, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about um, the marine layer. Yeah, in relation here to Northern California, the marine layer can certainly play tricks on our temperature. You can wake up to the 50s and low 60s. You can have that coastal marine layer into the Petaluma Valley and over Sonoma Mountain and into the valley floors uh, into Napa County as well. But as the sun comes up, as it heats up the ground, we see that erosion of the marine layer. The winds start to shift around as well. And before you know it, we go from 80 to 95 uh, here in Sonoma County. So uh, it certainly has a, here for Northern California, uh, Bay Area specific, the marine layer plays a huge influence. How thick is that marine layer? Uh, also, how long are the winds coming off of the ocean? These are all things that can play factor into how rapidly or how the temperature can just stay flat or stable uh, for several hours during the day. And I look at this as a nice thing because think about the places where it's just hot all the time. You don't get a break at night. So we're kind of lucky that we get to cool off and then heat back up. <laughs> exactly. So I, prior to being here in the Bay Area, um, I lived in Arizona for 11 years. I lived in the, in the Tucson area where our backyard hit 120 degrees a couple of times during a summer. And there's no break from it. And even when you have your shades drawn, uh, it's still very, very hot. But you're absolutely right with the relief or lack thereof, because during the nighttime hours, it can only drop to about 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. So that can uh, really be mentally and physically taxing on someone to deal with that day in and day out. And then we had another question from Hanai, who was age 10, if you remember. Mm -hmm. Why is there sun even in the winter? Jeff, do you want to start? The, I guess I can jump in. Uh, yeah, why is there a sun even in winter? Well, we need a ray of hope, right? Even though it's winter, you know, we need to have a ray of hope. But the sun is always there, whether it's winter or spring or summer. The sun is always there, even when the surface temperatures here are cold in Northern California. And again, this all relates to uh, how long the sun is out. Uh, during the seasons. In the wintertime, we don't get as much sunlight. Conversely, during the summer, we do, and that's why it is hotter during the summer. That's why we're cooler during the winter uh, as well. So even when it's super cold outside during the winter, 
Uh, the sun is still there, just the earth is tilted away from the sun, which is leading to shorter days, shorter amount of sunlight during the day. Yeah, and sometimes the sun hides behind the clouds or behind a marine layer like Jeff was talking about. That happens more uh, in the winter that it, it's cloudier, but the sun is, is always there, as Jeff said. And uh, yeah, there, there are more sunny days during the summer, obviously. Uh, but during, during the winter, it is there, sometimes hiding behind clouds. You can also have, have it be cold and sunny in the winter, um, especially if the winds bring in a cold air mass. So we're going to move on to pollution now, which probably has had you guys quite busy lately with all the fires. Uh, Jared, age 10, why is there pollution? That's a great question. Patrick, you want me to bat lead off on this one? I'll let you kind of sure. pick sure. up from there. So uh, Jared, great question. Why is there pollution? Well, there are numerous sources here on Earth that generate air pollution. Among them, us, humans, by driving by using plastics, uh, by burning things. Uh, we contribute to air pollution. Wildfires contribute to air pollution. Factories contribute to air pollution. Uh, these are all different things that can take our clean air and dirty them up uh, in a short amount of time. Patrick, I'll let you pick up from there. Well, that basically covers it. Like Jeff said, there are a lot of different sources of air pollution. Uh, some of them are human caused, some of them are natural. Yeah. And uh, we're always dealing with that. We've taken some steps to reduce the amount of pollution that humans add to the atmosphere, but it's still there. And uh, that's, that's why Jeff and I basically have jobs uh, because we are predicting that air pollution. And if you're curious about the human uh, aspect of adding to pollution, I want to remind you all that our last guest was from Sonoma Recology, and we covered a lot of the, the subjects of plastics and um, garbage and where it goes and what it does. So um, I encourage you to go find that guest if you missed it. Um, Nathan, age 11, when is air pollution going to stop? Jeff, I think you had prepared something on this, but I can, I can jump in. Um, yeah. Why don't, you, why don't you go ahead, Patrick? I'll, I'll let you and then I'll chime in. Well, the, the short story is it, air pollution is not going to stop, um, especially as, as long as, as humans are here and we are emitting pollutants into the atmosphere. But like we said, um, just with the last question, there are a lot of actions that we can take to minimize the amount of pollution that we're emitting into the atmosphere. Uh, some of those things we can do uh, using cleaner energy. So instead of, say, burning coal for energy, using uh, solar or wind energy, also reducing car trips, for instance. Uh, cars, since there are millions of cars on the road um, taken together, they can add a lot of pollution to the atmosphere. If we all take some steps to reduce uh, our car trips, then that can have a significant impact on, uh, on the air quality. Yeah, I think Patrick definitely hit on it. And one thing that, uh, for instance, how important is it for reducing driving? Well, during the summer months, the primary pollutant in our atmosphere is ozone. Uh, and ozone develops through a combination of factory emissions, car, car exhaust, and sunlight hitting it. Uh, that chemical combination creates ozone. And if we are able to just reduce our driving, maybe take our trips during the evening hours when the sun isn't out. That can really go a long way. One action, one action that you can take can go a long way in reducing air pollution. And I, I did want to say that the air quality is better now, generally, especially in California, better now than it was, say, 40 years ago. Um, we've taken steps to reduce uh, the emissions coming from cars and that has really helped in addition to a number of other actions we've taken, but the air quality has really improved, uh, especially since I was, I was a kid growing up in Southern California. I think you guys don't get a lot of opportunities to have actual physical evidence of this, especially since in LA, everybody wants to be in their car. But one of the fascinating things was when we got the stay at home orders and everybody was forced to stay home for, I, I think it was two weeks before people really started driving again. You could, you could see the difference. Um, I think parents can look up those pictures for kids if they want to see an actual before and after to kind of get an idea what stopping the, the amount of cars actually does make an impact. Yeah. And Jeff and I are actually working on 
a project right now analyzing that exact thing. We're looking at air quality in the Sacramento region um, during uh, the earlier stages of the pandemic and during the shelter in place orders, especially looking at late March into April, uh, early May and analyzing what the air quality, the observed air quality was during that period versus the surrounding periods, but also looking back to years in the past. So comparing April this year, say to April last year or all Aprils looking back the last decade. And what we've seen so far is that there was a, a really significant impact just from that reduced activity in helping to clean up the air. I think that's gonna be really interesting. Um, Let's see, and speaking of cars, Jonah, age 10, wants to know, are cars making the Earth's weather dangerous? Uh, well, that's complex. I, the short answer is um, not directly, but it's possible. And one mechanism that we can sort of walk through is through that, that global warming that we were talking about before, where I said there are certain gases that we emit that uh, lead to warming more rapidly than, than we would expect. So cars emit some of those uh, pollutants and some of those gases that can contribute to global warming. Now, under a global warming situation, there are um, certain weather events that might happen more frequently, which can be dangerous. Jeff, did you wanna talk a little bit about this? Yeah, uh, and I think that studies have shown that there is some fairly strong correlation um, in relation to global warming and its impacts on droughts uh, and temperatures increasing globally. Uh, and here in Northern California, where there's drought, vegetation dries out, uh, and that can lead to more explosive fire growth, larger wildfires. Um, in relation to tornadoes and hurricanes, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to see if global warming is having an impact on those things. There's not a real good correlation between those. Uh, but for uh, larger scale events like droughts and wildfires and globally the temperature going up, yeah, there is a relation uh, between global warming making those things worse or hotter. So let's see, we have Brady, oh wait, Jaden, I skipped Jaden, sorry, Jaden, age 10. Uh, why don't we focus on the problems we have right now? Which problems are we talking about? That's right. yeah. <laughs> I feel like you are focusing on them. I'm gonna give you guys a pat on the back. I think you guys are focusing on them. <laughs> so I'm thinking when, when Jaden asked this question, um, it might've been during that period when we had a lot of dense smoke from wildfires. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. And whenever there's smoke from wildfires, uh, Jeff and I do focus uh, very intently on the, on the current situation. Um, it it ju doesn't just lead to poor air quality right now, but it, it's difficult to make a really accurate forecast. So we sort of go into uh, high gear when we're making our air quality forecasts. So that, that was really uh, mid-August that we had that lightning uh, episode that led to a number of fires all over Northern California. A lot of those fires became very large and produced a lot of smoke. A lot of that smoke was transported directly into uh, Sonoma County and, some, and there, there were periods of light winds where the smoke just lingered. So um, that was something that we were, we were watching very closely. The air quality was really bad on a lot of days and finally the um, the fires died down, there was less smoke production, and especially on days when there was a wind shift, especially winds coming from the ocean that could sort of push the smoke out of our area and bring some cleaner air in behind it. Um, so we're always watching the, the fire and smoke situation, keeping an eye out for new fires that might pop up, trying to see if they're producing a lot of smoke and if that smoke might uh, affect our, our region. Um, it's something that we watch every day. I should also mention Patrick too, you know, along with uh, Patrick and I as air quality meteorologists, um, we have many air quality scientists that work at Sonoma Technology, a lot of very bright men and women that are working on tackling the problems that we have right now with air pollution, uh, not only here in the United States, but globally as well with several international projects that we do work on. So it is being addressed. I don't think there is any clean solution that we're gonna come out with in the short term, in the near term that is. 
but it is something that we're all working toward, uh, is working on this problem and coming up with a solution, uh, if not now, down the road. So Brady, age 10, um, <laughs> grammar on this one, why does people pollute the sea and earth and how much pollution is produced every day? That's yeah, a tough Patrick, one. I can see your stuff. Yeah, this, this, one, this one is, Patrick, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, bat lead off here on this one. Why do people pollute the sea? I, I, you know what? That That's a question that maybe doesn't have an answer. I don't know if we can answer for human activity on why people pollute. But uh, I do know this, that us as humans, we're always going to have an influence on this earth, uh, be it with polluting the sea or with air pollution, with driving, with wildfires out there. Um, we're always going to have an influence on pollution levels, us humans uh, here on earth. So it's important to take inventory and see what can we do to reduce our carbon footprint each and every day. And we, I know we've talked about it before, and I'll mention it again, reducing our driving, reducing our waste, recycling, uh, investing in clean energy. Perhaps one day we can have a grid that's on wind and fully on solar. I mean, these are all solutions that uh, could lessen our human impact on pollution here on Earth. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I mean, it, it's kind of sad, but as long as there are humans, there's probably going to be some pollution. As long as there are wildfires, there's going to be some pollution. But as Jeff pointed out, there are a lot of steps that we can take uh, to reduce the amount of air pollution that we are contributing. Um, so yeah, the, the second part of that question, how much pollution is produced every day? Well, that, that's a, a big question. There are a lot of different pollutants, um, but I looked up just, just one of them. Uh, I was uh, looking at CO2, so that's carbon dioxide. Um, and according to this source, uh, 43 billion tons of CO2 are produced worldwide uh, per year. So you can divide that up to get the per day um, emissions, but that, that's a lot of tons of CO2. Um, and that, that amount of CO2, especially because carbon dioxide is uh, a greenhouse gas that, that does contribute to global warming, unfortunately. And that's directly related to people. Yes, yeah. that, was, that was the human uh, emitted car, uh, carbon dioxide. So we have a new subject now. We're going into the ozone and climate change. So Lucia, age 10, wants to know what is the ozone? And Tig, age 10, wants to know how big is the ozone layer? So ozone, that, that's a great question. And ozone uh, can be complicated, but basically it's an ozone molecule is three oxygen uh, atoms tied together. And the thing that we learn as air quality scientists and forecasters is that Ozone near the ground is harmful. Ozone high up above the ground actually is helpful. So uh, when we are forecasting air quality, we're talking about just the ozone very near the ground. And as Jeff mentioned before, um, that ozone is formed by emissions from, from cars and other sources plus sunlight. But the ozone up high in the atmosphere, so this we're talking about miles above the atmosphere, that actually blocks uh, harmful uh, UV rays from the sun. And that ozone layer around the entire earth actually protects humans um, and, and plants as well. Um, the ozone layer basically does cover the entire globe, although there is a hole over Antarctica and scientists have been tracking that. And uh, we've actually tried to reduce the emissions of certain pollutants that lead to uh, basically the eating away of that ozone layer over Antarctica. So we've tried to uh, repair that hole. I should add that we have an acquaintance that Patrick and I uh, had had met earlier in the year at a conference that has maybe the best analogy for ozone that I think I've heard. Ozone, good up high, bad below. Okay. Uh, Jaden, age 10. Um, he said that he wanted to hear from an expert on air. So I would argue that we're talking to them now. <laughs> Hi, Jaden. Um, and he, he says, what can you tell us about it, about air? That is a great broad question. And uh, air, air is complicated. 
but it's it's got a lot of different gases, mostly nitrogen, a lot of oxygen too, which we breathe. It has other elements in it. Um, it extends, like I said, miles above above the ground, uh, and it has pollutants in it. But it also has clouds and moisture. It has different air masses of different temperatures. So it it's a fascinating mixture and. The way that air moves around the globe, which is a sphere, and it's not just a sphere, but it's a rotating sphere, the, the, the math and the physics that go into trying to figure out how air is moving around the Earth are very complex, and it makes it um, difficult, challenging, but exciting to forecast the weather and the air quality. Yeah, air just doesn't move from west to east. Because of the Earth's spin, there is a north to south component to moving air as well. And that's where uh, the challenge comes in for us meteorologists and air quality meteorologists to figure out where that air is moving and what is potentially pushing or possibly what it could be cleaning out uh, near a source area for pollution. And Riley, age 11, uh, she has another big question. What is climate change? So climate, I like to talk about the difference between climate and weather. So weather is sort of what's happening right now or in the very short-term climate, we're looking at very long-term averages uh, in those weather conditions. So we might be talking about the 10-year average or changes that happen over the course of maybe 100 years or 1,000 years. So weather, very short-term, sort of today, tomorrow, maybe next week, climate, uh, very long-term. So when we talk about climate change, we're talking about very gradual changes uh, in, in the patterns, um, in the climate patterns. So we can talk about changes in temperature, um, changes in the frequency of storms, um, but these are very gradual changes and we have to be careful um, to distinguish that from just short-term weather changes. We're talking about very long-term averages uh, that shift. So. Um, there are several causes of climate change. Some of them are natural. There are natural cycles in the climate, especially the temperature over thousands, even millions of years um, on the earth. But there's also human induced or human caused climate change. We've talked a little bit about that too. And Jade, age 10, wanted to know how does the climate change? And so we just answered that, but I wanted to make sure that Jade got her question asked. Um, Trevor, age 10, why do some places have climate change? So the other thing I wanted to mention about climate is that um, you can talk about the climate of a very specific region, but you can also talk about it um, globally. And so the change that I was talking about before, where we're just talking about a very gradual change, I was sort of... Um, making a, a vague reference to the entire globe, but it is important to ask, uh, how will the climate change in a very specific region? And it's different from region to region. I actually studied this in, in graduate school, how the, uh, the climate was, going, was predicted to change over the next 100 years in the Pacific Northwest, so Washington State, where I was looking. Um, it's, it is very complex, I know I've said that a lot, but, um, the way that a particular region responds to global climate change has to do with its, uh, its local, basically forcing mechanisms, as we call it. That's a fancy way of saying what's, what's controlling the weather and climate in this particular region. It could be um, a mountain range or how close they are to the ocean or if they're near a river valley. So some places will see more rapid climate change. Some places on earth will see uh, a more gradual climate change. And it really depends on uh, the local situation in, in every region. And then uh, this is another multiple kid question. So this must be another big one. Aiden, age 10, how do you stop climate change? Nolan, age 10, wants to know, can we? And similar, Riley, age 11, how is it going to affect the future? I'm gonna to try to be as glass half full as possible here. <laughs> uh, the climate is always changing. Uh, so the, there really is no stopping climate change. Um, we do have warm periods, we do have cold periods. Uh, we're in a warm period right now and humans are contributing to that. Uh, so how is it going to affect the future and how can we stop climate change? The only thing that I think we can really do is just, as we've already talked about is 
changing our human behavior to maybe lessen our impact on climate change. As mentioned, the climate is always changing and we are in a warm period right now that we are contributing to. So one, uh, one or two things that we can take out of our day-to-day -day life or reduce in our day-to-day -day life from driving to recycling to uh, burning, if we can reduce some of that, uh, that can certainly lessen the impact of climate change uh, here in the world. And we mentioned before certain greenhouse gases. We didn't really discuss the greenhouse effect, but basically there's certain gases that act um, as a blanket over the earth. They absorb the sun's heat, they emit it, and they create basically a, a blanket of, of heat around the globe. And some gases are much more effective at doing that than others. And what we can do as humans is try to reduce the amount of emissions of those certain gases that are really strong greenhouse gases. And Aiden also wanted to know this one, uh, which I don't know that there's an answer to, but you guys are the experts, so I'll let you figure it out. Um, when and how did climate change start? I can start really quickly and I'll sort of toss it over to you, Jeff. But Jeff, like Jeff just mentioned, um, the climate is always changing because there are some, some natural uh, mechanisms that create climate change and there na there's natural variability in the climate. But the most recent climate warming, I'll hand that over to Jeff, yeah. Yeah, so the most recent climate warming, uh, I, I think can be probably linked back to the Industrial Revolution back in the 1800s. Um, as Patrick and I were kind of preparing for this uh, discussion for the kiddos, um, the one thing we pointed to is basically when we started burning things to heat our houses, to make products for our day-to-day -day lives. When the industrial revolution began, we started spewing pollutants into the atmosphere, uh, further enacting those greenhouse gases, which act like a blanket that absorb and then emit heat and in turn makes it warmer here on earth. And then uh, Tig, age 10, how is global warming destroying our earth? So there can be a number of negative impacts from global warming. We've touched on a few of them already, but just sort of highlighting uh, more frequent heat waves, um, more frequent droughts, also sea level rise can threaten communities that are really close uh, to sea level near the ocean. Um, so there are some ways that it, it, it can damage the earth. It can also damage certain uh, ecosystems, um, plant life, impact animals, not just, not just humans. Um, but I did want to offer some hope. Um, there are a lot of scientists studying this specific problem and trying to come up with solutions so that we don't harm the planet and ourselves uh, too badly. And like we've sort of been saying throughout, how do we reduce emissions to avoid um, further impacts? That, that's one of the big questions on our minds. Um, it can be difficult when um, you know we're used to driving a lot um, and we, we rely on a lot of different uh, energy sources that do emit pollutants. Um, it does require a little bit of, of change on, on everyone's part, um, but we are studying the problem and we're optimistic that we can um, sort of repair, repair the climate and um, prevent really damaging future impacts. And our last question was from Coulter, age 10, who wanted to know what what is greenhouse gas, which we just covered, but is there anything else you want to add to that uh, for him? Um, I think I think we covered that, but it, it is a gas that warms the atmosphere because it acts uh, like a blanket, basically uh, responding to the, the energy input from the sun and then warming warming the globe there. I can mention a couple of greenhouse gases, uh, specifically carbon dioxide, dioxide is one that we mentioned before, um, also methane. Um, also, water vapor actually serves as a, as a greenhouse gas uh, to some extent. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically the short answer, but I, I encourage, encourage you to uh, study it more. We do need more scientists studying this problem and helping to come up with solutions. Well, and that was leading to a, a question from me. If kids are listening and they're fascinated by what you do, um, what are some of the subjects that they might want to start looking at studying in school? Uh, I would start off by obviously seeing a lot of science. Uh, get really invested into the science work that you're going to be doing in your school. Um, while it's not 
used on a day-to-day -day basis in direct application for us as air quality meteorologists, uh, but math kind of sets your brain into a different level of thinking. Um, it, it helps you solve critical problems like two plus two equals four, or in what we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, air pollution looking at weather models to see if they are right on with what could be transpiring in the next seven to 10 days. Uh, climate models, they use math equations as well. Uh, math kind of sets your brain into that critical thinking phase. So you start to take a look at the bigger picture with just one question and start to think of different solutions. Yeah, and I, I mentioned uh, in addition to math before physics, um, we studied physics to learn about how, how the atmosphere moves around on the globe. Um, and then when we develop these sophisticated uh, computer models, that's, that's computer science, but applying what we know from math and physics to develop those models. So that's probably farther down the line. Um, but yeah, especially paying attention to, to math and science, that's, that gives you a great foundation. Well, we've been talking to Patrick and Jeff from Sonoma Technology. Kids, great questions again. Um, if they have more questions for you, can they reach out to Sonoma Technology? Absolutely. Yeah, we'd love to hear from them. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time today. And thanks, kids, for listening. And keep sending in great questions. And I've already got pretty much the whole rest of the year um, booked up with guests because they all had suggestions. So they're doing such a great job. Thank awesome. you guys so much. Well, thank, thank you for the you opportunity. Yeah, and thanks for the great questions. Yes. Awesome.